Okay, great. We've got a, a good group here today. Uh, hello, my name is Doug Bruggeman. I'm with Ecological Services and Markets, and we specialize in developing uh, cap and trade systems at a landscape scale for natural resources. And I've been hosting the seminar series, the conversations on species credits, um, uh, with the help of uh, Donna Collier, Craig Denisoff, Greg DeYoung, and Sarah Johnson on the steering committee. And our goal is to discuss successes and barriers in species crediting in the US to help uh, shine a brighter light on the issue and, um, and get more in private investment dollars into biodiversity conservation. So we're very excited today to have uh, Laurel Lowe, who's with the Landscape Conservation Planning Program with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, discuss the California Conservation Banking Program. And uh, Betty Rambaran will also be supporting the presentation. Uh, Betty is a senior environmental scientist and a supervisory position with the California Department of Fishing and Wildlife. And um, it's gonna be a great talk about you know, the program and how they make banking happen um, at, at large scales. So hopefully we can learn uh, for other states as well. So. Just uh, as a reminder, we do record these sessions and we will later share them on YouTube. And uh, hopefully we'll hoping for a robust discussion after a 20 minute presentation by, by Laurel. And during Laurel's talk, I wanna encourage you to uh, post questions in the chat box to everybody. And then we will get to those chats uh, when we can. I believe uh, Laurel may pause in the middle to address questions as they come. And then, um, and then later, you know, I would invite you to, once we hit some of those questions, I would invite you to unmute yourself and allow for a, a discussion. So with that, I wanna hand it over to uh, Laurel Lowe to take it away. I wanted to do just a, a, a brief introduction again. I know you just repeated um, what you said. Um, you already said what I was gonna say, but I wanted to also just, um, Kind of just give a little bit of the layout of how the department works. So Laurel and I both work at um, headquarters, so we are, have headquarter functions. So we mostly, um, uh, we our main functions are to implement policies. We update procedures and guidelines. Uh, we update legislation as needed, propose legislative changes if needed. Um, we also track data. We have to report to the legislature every year, all of the banks that have been submitted, all the proposed banks, all of our timelines, if we met them or not, and our fees. And we also train staff among all the other things we do at headquarters. And our regional staff uh, review proposed banks, and they also implement the banking program. So some of those particular, maybe um, uh, specific uh, bank review questions, we might be able to answer some of those but most of our regional staff are the ones that do all the legwork when reviewing and approving banks. So with that, I'd like to hand that over to Laurel. Great, thanks Betty and thanks Doug for coordinating this and uh, this is a great opportunity for us all just to learn. I was in so listen to some of the other sessions and um, they, I've learned a lot from them already. So as Doug said, my name is Laurel Lowe and I'm an environmental scientist with CDFW, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I'm gonna share with you a little bit about our mitigation and conservation banking program. So just a quick outline of what I'll discuss today. Some of the drivers of mitigation in California are landscape conservation planning tools, the federal and state policies that guide our program, CDFW program and processes, and then some contacts and resources at the end for you all. And of course, we'll have time at the end for any questions. California is an ecologically important area. There are over 40,000 species that depend on California ecosystems. We have a wide range of species and taxa, as you can see listed on this slide, that live in our California ecosystems from the deserts, forests, mountains, oceans. Um, however, some of these species are at risk. There are over 300 federal and state threatened or endangered species that reside here. 
Mitigation is spurred by federal or state statutes that provide environmental protections. So, for example, we have the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA, the, and that's the California equivalent of NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. We also have the California Endangered Species Act and the Federal Clean Water Act. So those are just a few uh, examples of those environmental protections. Under these statutes, activities that can destroy, degrade, or adversely impact the environment may require mitigation or compensation for impacts to those natural resources. So compensatory mitigation is usually done by permanently protecting habitat sufficient to offset the losses of those project activities. Here are a few examples of mitigation drivers in California. Uh, I mentioned before CESA and CEQA. We also have some others like the Lake and Streambed Alteration Agreement. Uh, you might hear that referred to as 1600. And we also have the Porter Clone Water Quality Control Act. Federally, we have the Endangered Species Act and the Clean Water Act, both sections 404 and 401. So when we're looking at the benefits of banking, I think it's important to look at what the alternatives are. So when mitigation is required for a CDFW permit, the permittee has two options. They can buy credits from a bank or they can do permittee responsible mitigation, also known as PRM. Depending on the size of that uh, project, a permittee responsible mitigation project might end up being pretty small and fragmented um, a mitigation site that's just really not as ecologically valuable. Banks, on the other hand, are able to combine or provide credits for many different projects. So they end up being larger, more connected, more ecologically meaningful areas of preserved or restored constructed habitat. So those are a few of the ecological benefits, but there are also benefits to the permittee. So for banks, the regulating state and federal agencies have already confirmed that the established bank can provide adequate mitigation for whatever habitat or species mitigation that it's been credited for. So in that sense, the bank streamlined the regulatory process by providing ready to go mitigation instead of someone having to do their own project. Otherwise, if the, or the permittee is doing their own permittee responsible mitigation, it can take a lot of time and cost searching for a suitable mitigation site, figuring out the costs and efforts to do the restoration. And then also there's the burden of protecting that land in perpetuity. So banking is just one of CDFW's many conservation planning tools. So I just wanted to highlight kind of the breadth of what we have as well. We have the Natural Community Conservation Plans called NCCPs, and those are the state equivalent of Habitat Conservation Plans or HCPs that you might have heard of. NCCPs are collab collaborative planning efforts, and they create a permit for the take of a species, and they're able to do that because they go beyond just mitigation to actually conserving those species. We also have Regional Conservation Investment Strategies or RCISs. Those are a relatively new program and they provide a structure for voluntary conservation planning. We also have voluntary local programs as well as safe harbor agreements. And those safe harbor agreements are again, similar to the federal program. So I wanted to touch a little bit on the history of banking in California. California has had various state uh, laws and policies that have guided banking starting as early as 1993. The original act, however, was very specific. It's the San Joaquin or Sacramento San Joaquin Valley Wetland Mitigation Act. And so over time, those policies have changed. And now we have the current Fish and Game Code, which provides, which provides guidance on our conservation and mitigation banks um, for bank statewide. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about our banking program and diving into that code, that is in section 1796 through 1799.1. So I just discussed a few of the policies that shape our program, but there's really a little bit 
more to the backstory of why our program is what it is today. Originally, we didn't have a dedicated funding source for CDFW's banking program. Uh, during the recession, the state agency had reductions in 2011, and so many CDFW positions were lost, and we also lost funding. So the program ended up being suspended in early 2012, um, so no new banks were being reviewed. The bank community, however, um, really liked this program and pushed for it to continue, and even if that meant adding fees. So the banking community worked in collaboration with CDFW to restart the program, and they did that through Senate Bill 1148, which was signed in 2012 and actually became effective January 1st, 2013. The banking program was able to resume, but now as a fee-based program, and um, it all, the code also formalized the process for reviewing, approving, and implementing banks. Uh, additionally, the code required CDFW to adopt guidelines, um, working with those stakeholders, so those were finalized uh, and approved in 2014. So while that was all going on in California, meanwhile, the federal banking, or banking agencies were also working on guidance. Um, as early as 1981, agencies were developing their own guidelines, including the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA NIMS, uh, U.S. Army Corps. And so you can see here they have a list of, or here's a list of their rules, guidance, or policies that they have for banking. So as the federal and state guidance systems were being developed early on in the banking program, they saw the need to work collaboratively together to align processes and practices. So you can see here on this slide is a list of the state banking agencies working together. We have the California Natural Resources Agency, us of course, CDFW, NOAA NIMS, the US Army Corps, US EPA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Department of Ag, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and the California Water Boards. So those partners worked, started working together and eventually signed an MOU, and that created interagency working groups to work on uh, creating joint procedures and templates for those prospective bank sponsors within California. So I want to give you a brief history of how that all came to be. In 2003, the core started developing mitigation banking templates for use within their San Francisco district. They have three districts within California. Um, and then in 2005, bank sponsors were giving positive feedback, saying they liked the template, it was working, and they encouraged the state and federal agencies to collaborate together to establish a framework for mitigation banks throughout all of California. So that was heard, and in 2006, we have our first multi-agency MOU established, consisting of seven different agencies. Just two years later, the agencies developed their first set of templates, um, and they all met the compliance with the laws for those seven agencies. And I'm currently in one of those work groups trying to update those templates, and I know that's a lot of work to try to get that all, so that first round was really quite a feat. Um, in 2011, the MOU was actually renewed, and they added another agency, the California State Water Resources Control Board. So the MOU created working groups. There are three of them. There's the interagency review team, which is known as the IRT. That's staff level working on reviewing the banks. We also have the PDT, the project delivery team. They create templates and processes for the state banking. And they also review any precedent setting decisions made by the IRT or proposed by the IRT. Then our last working group is the BAMT, that is the Bank Agency Management Team, and that's upper management who um, does any approvals as needed. All right, so the PDT has been hard at work and has created many templates, so I just wanted to highlight some of them here. We have our BEI, or Bank Enabling Template, 
And this is made specifically for California based on that MOU. This was updated just earlier this year. Uh, our BEI is an agreement between the bank sponsor, the bank property owner, and the signatory agencies that have jurisdiction over those natural resources that are being conserved for the bank. Um, and just to um, highlight that bank sponsor is the proponent for that bank, they may or may not be the same person as the landowner or entity. The BEI also identifies the conditions and criteria for the bank establishment, the management, and the operations. So it's really that go-to document to understand how the, bunk, how the bank is working. Something also unique about California is the BEI requires an endowment for the long-term stewardship of that property. So this helps ensures that there's money to protect and manage this land in perpetuity. We also have a conservation easement template and there are many different types of conservation easements, but this template is made specifically for banking. This is the deed used to preserve the land for and resources in perpetuity, but also allows the property owner to retain um, some of their uh, private property rights. And this conservation easement will follow the land, uh, not the property owner as um, property owners can change over time. We also have our long-term management plan that ensures that the bank is um, managed, monitored, and maintained in perpetuity for the natural resources on that bank. And that is um, in progress right now. We're working on an update for that. We have our banking checklist. So obviously that's not a template, but that is a list of requirements that help bank sponsors send the whole package for proposal for um, IRT agencies to review when they're uh, sending their bank proposals in. That was recently updated just earlier this year in 2021. We have our property assessment and warranty, also known as a PAW, that describes the impact anything affecting the title may have on the conservation easement or fee title. And then finally, we have our development plan, and that describes the construction and habitat establishment, restoration, whatever needs to be done um, to develop that bank. And that template is also currently in progress. So we got a, a lot of moving parts right now that we're working on. Those are all available on our CDFW website, and you can also find them on the core or the services websites. So I discussed a little bit about the collaboration between agencies in our banking program, but I also wanted to highlight the collaboration with our stakeholders. Uh, for example, we received some feedback from our bank sponsors saying that they wanted more opportunities for discussion within our BEI procedures, specifically for uh, one section extraordinary circumstances. That feedback was heard and the BEI template was altered to include more opportunities for collaboration between the IRT as, and the bank sponsor and property owner. So uh, when we updated the BEI template back in 2017, and now included the new process that you can see here on the slide. Uh, so the bank sponsor would first notify the IRT if an extraordinary circumstance occurred on their bank. So that might be an earthquake or a wildfire. Um, and then the parties would meet, including the IRT, to discuss, okay, is this actually an extraordinary circumstance? If the IRT agrees, they would provide written notification to that bank sponsor. Then they'd have another meeting to discuss potential remedial actions. If they end up not being able to come to a decision and agree, they can then use the established uh, dispute resolution process, which is defined in another section of the BEI. So this example highlights really collaboration in two levels. One, by including feedback um, from our stakeholders, but also um, having more collaboration in the BEI template itself for procedures we may use. And so I just wanted to pause there real quick. Um, Doug, are there any questions? We're gonna, this is kind of like the big picture, and then we're gonna go into a little bit on um, CDFW specific procedures uh, in the next slide. So we can pause here to see if there are any questions on, on that. 
Well, Laura, I, I currently don't have any questions. So it's a good reminder for folks to go ahead and start writing down your questions in the, in the chat box to everybody. And, um, and we'll get to those at the end as well. Of course, happy to take any questions right now. If you want to unmute yourself for any from the uh, first half of the presentation. Okay, so I feel like right. let's, let's move on. Sounds good. All right, so now that you have a sense of our framework that we're working with, I'll tell you a little bit about the details of our banking program. Currently, CDFW is signatory to 87 conservation and mitigation banks across the state. That's protecting about 68,000 acres, and you can see them um, scattered across the state in this map here. In California, however, there are more banks. There are 138 conservation and mitigation banks that have been approved. So this includes banks that CDFW might not be signatory to. For example, if there's only wetland credits or if there's only federally listed species um, credits on that bank, then CDFW will not be a signatory. And then I just wanted to highlight a couple banks. Uh, Bracket Marsh, which was established in 1981, was one of the first mitigation banks in, made in the U.S. and also just happens to be in California. And then we have Coles Levy Conservation Bank, which was the first conservation bank established in California from 1992. So I'm going to go now into some of the details of creating a new bank. So bank sponsors should consider several factors when selecting that location for that new bank. Uh, you can see uh, the list here on this slide, but one of the main ones, number one, is the market demand and site availability. Banking is a business and those bank sponsors are trying to make a return on their investment by selling credits. So the location of that bank and the species or habitat credits that are available drives the market for selling those credits. And that of course is dependent on the permits processed in that area requiring compensatory mitigation. Site availability is huge, especially in California. Uh, land is expensive and um, sometimes like in Southern California, it's just hard to come by even if you have that funding source. Bank sponsors should consider what resources are likely to be impacted in the area in the future, and then also think about what credits are already available in that area. So a few other considerations, the ecological value, what species are already present, some landscape considerations, especially if there's um, construction needed for that bank and there's recontouring, it's really important to have a good understanding of the hydrology there. Thinking about adjacent land uses, climate change, these properties are going to be protected in perpetuity. So thinking about, you know, what's this going to look like 50, 100 years down the line. Uh, management factors and challenges can include environmental contaminants that might be present or nearby. Restoration needs, how much money is that going to cost? What is that going to look like? Uh, any encumbrances? and cultural resources on the property, as well as any conflicting uses. So some locations just might not be appropriate for banking. Uh, so a couple examples of that, if a land does not have significant biological resources, there could be incompatible uses that limit the ecological function of that bank. For example, a landfill is just not gonna be as good. There could also be incompatible encumbrances, such as mineral rights. And then, of course, if the land is already used uh, for mitigation, we don't want to have double dipping. So that would not work for a bank. All right. So that prospective bank sponsor might have found um, a site that they think could work for a bank. And now they're thinking we're going to be wanting credits for state listed species and candidate species. So the next step for that bank sponsor would be to contact our CDFW regional bank coordinator. And those coordinators are available as a resource for bank, sponsor, bank sponsors considering 
locations for prospective banks, um, and they'll be the same people reviewing any proposed banks. As you can see here on the slide, um, our state is divided into seven CDFW regions. There's six land-based regions, and then the seventh region is our marine region. So um, you can use this map or some of our other resources on our website to figure out what region your um, proposed bank site is in, and then check our website. You can see there at the bottom to find the appropriate banking coordinator contact. So once you're ready to begin the review process, here's a quick outline of what that's gonna look like. As I said before, our CDFW review process is established by code, and it includes fees and review timelines for each phase. The first phase is optional. It's a draft prospectus phase. And so that requires less information and is cheaper in terms of how much, how much money you're gonna spend for fees. And it's really good if you're just trying to get a sense, hey, is this even gonna make sense to pursue a bank in this location? The next two phases are required, the prospectus and bank agreement phases. Those each have fees and review timelines. Uh, 30 days for completeness and 90 days for acceptability. Those uh, timelines are similar to that of the Army Corps. So that's the outline for our process for developing the bank. Once that bank is already established and if the bank sponsor wants to make an alteration to the BEI, then they'd have to do an amendment. So that's not listed here, but the process is similar. There's also gonna be a fee and associated review timelines. All right, so I just wanted to leave you all with a couple of resources if you're a bank sponsor wanting some documents to look at. These are some ones you can find on our website. Uh, the PDT has recently updated both the checklist and the proposal guidance this year. Um, so you can check those out on our website. All right, so I'll stop there. I hope that was a good overview of our program. If you want to dive deeper, feel free to check out our website link on the slide there. And you can also um, ask us any questions now, but if you want to talk offline or um, think of a question later, you can definitely uh, email mitbank at wildlife.ca.gov and Betty or I will probably be answering those questions. So do you have any questions now? <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. That was a great um, overview of the program. And thank you for sharing on the website, especially for the templates, how you do the work. Um, I, I'll just, uh, I guess I'll start with, we have one question in the chat box to start with. Um, from Cody McDonald, he asks, which stakeholder typically drives the process to create a country bank, the landowner, the proponent, or the agency? Secondly, how long does it typically take to set up and authorize the construction bank? Yeah, so usually it's the proponent that drives the process. Um, they will be working with the landowner. Sometimes that could be the same person, but they'll have to work in conjunction with them, especially for the conservation easement and, and getting details on the property. Um, and then for the second question, it's a wide range it can take. It really depends on how much homework the bank sponsor has done beforehand and if there are any kind of complexities going on in that property itself, like any encumbrances uh, that might just make it a little more complicated, as well as how many agencies are um, signatory. So you just have to have all those review timelines going on together. And so sometimes it can take a little bit. You're waiting for one, you're waiting for the other, and just making them all come together all at the same time as you go through those steps uh, can take a little bit longer. But I think it can take like three to seven years, depending. Betty, do you have anything to add on that? Nope, that, that pretty much covers it. Great, are there other questions? Does anybody want to unmute themselves to ask a question? Yeah, Betty and, and Laurel, a great presentation and, and uh, really appreciate you coming and 
coming and, and sharing with us. So it's interesting, you know, when we go to different states, they a lot of a lot of times the reaction still to this day is that oh, there's no way that you can do a joint wetland and species bank. And uh, and so I guess and part of part of why it works is that you have this interagency group, you've developed templates and stuff. And so I guess the question is based on what you've seen happen in California, do you think that multi-agency proactive planning effort, can that be replicated or did, was there something that just created these unique circumstances and it'll never happen again anywhere else? Um, I can let Betty touch on that because she's been with the banking program longer than me, especially when it was um, redeveloped or reinstated back in 2012, but um, I just wanted to note that, you know, in the meetings that I have been in, it really takes, um, you know, everyone really has to put that effort forward, not just to review the banks, but also for the overall, you know, the team to update those templates. And so it does take, you know, putting that time aside to prioritize um, those efforts. Um, yeah, Betty, do you have anything to add? Yeah, and, um, you know, I think when, the banking program was first starting to develop, the multi-agencies saw the need to work collaboratively because what was going on is you've got a proponent uh, proposing a bank and they're working with the department, our department, and then they were working with Fish and Wildlife Service separately, then they were working with Army Corps separately, and each agency has different requirements. And so trying to put that all in one document, trying to meet everybody's needs was taking so much longer. So by having all agencies talk together and work together and putting all of their requirements in one document that just really helped streamline the process now how did that happen was it a fluke or was it just you know a few a small group of uh, people working together in an area that just saw that there was a need and um other i would say bank probably bank proponents saw that the process seemed to work really well that that's probably where it stemmed from um i know laurel touched a little bit Back in 2003, the San Francisco uh, District for Army Corps was the first ones, I believe, that um, created this template. And it just uh, worked. And the bank sponsors saw that there was a need for this collaboration. And that's kind of where it stemmed from. And I see there's a question in the chat box. Um, yeah, just getting to that question in the chat box. Uh, so are these uh, multi species banks? Are there any of them that are multi-species banks and how, how do you manage that? Yes, um, so in California, we have what we call a conservation bank and a mitigation bank. Um, they're all used for mitigation. So it's the, the, the word is, a, you know, when we separate it like that, it's a little confusing, but I think we do that distinction because of, for us in California, mitigation bank always includes wetlands. So there will always be wetlands when you see a mitigation bank. And then on top of that, there might also be species and habitat credits. A conservation bank, for the most part, doesn't have wetland credits. That means Army Corps hasn't signed on to it. You'll have species and habitat credits. And those can also be multi-agency, but it would only be mostly the wildlife agencies. CDFW, Fish and Wildlife Service, no one NIMPS. So um, sometimes we've got species that are duly listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act and California Endangered Species Act, but there are also uh, listed species that aren't duly listed. Some of them are only um, California uh, listed or only federally listed. So in those banks, oftentimes you will find um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife signatory to the bank along with some of the other agencies. And we do have, I think it's a total of six banks, four that are currently open and selling credit that are CDFW only banks. And those banks, the, the credits that they're selling are state listed only banks, state listed species only banks and habitat. They didn't um, have Fish and Wildlife Service sign on because there wasn't a, a federally listed species on that particular site. Or in some occasions, maybe the bank sponsor did not want to have another agency sign on because they wanted their bank to be approved faster. And maybe they felt, you know, they did, they weighed their, they, they did their analysis and they realized that we would be able to sell um, state listed species faster and get this bank approved faster so that they can get their, you know, uh, return of, of um, investing in the bank faster. 
So there could be multiple reasons, but those are usually the main reasons why you'll see these different banks with different signature, signatory agencies on. Great. Well, I was curious, it was interesting to hear about the marine service areas. Are there one or more marine banks currently? We haven't signed on to any. We've been part of the IRT. Um, I think there's, I don't know, they're all mitigation banks. I don't know the exact number, but I know there was one that was recently signed in Southern California. I don't remember if it was San Diego County or LA County. It's called Los Cerritos Mitigation Bank. Um, and um, I don't know that much about details. I sort of couldn't tell you how that service area works. It's probably those intertidal type um, species. But again, I don't know that much about that bank. Um, and there was another one, I think it was in one of the, maybe Port of LA. And I'm not sure where that ended up, if it was ever approved, but it was proposed. Army Corps would be able to give you more information on those. But again, we've been part of the IRT and we just didn't sign on because there wasn't any credits that, that were uh, CDFW type credits or state listing species credits on there. Right. But we do have we a contact if there's anybody that has a question on it. We do have a bank contact for that region. And it, maybe it's not marine, but we do have aquatic species banks. So some have fish credits. Um, and so that's pretty cool. There's a couple banks that now have uh, fish credits as well as 1600 for our uh, lake and stream bed alterations. But those are more inland terrestrial. Right, fresh water, yeah. Okay, great, yeah, thanks. And um, are there more questions? Anybody else want, want to offer a question uh, and unmute themselves? This is Cody. I uh, just have one more question. Thanks for the presentation. I thought that was really great. Um, the last question I had is about like currency of banks. Do they typically operate on an acre to acre approach or is habitat functionality, for example, involved through like a habitat equivalency analysis or habitat quantification tool? We usually, it's usually an acre by acre to one to one ratio, but more in depth information to that might be, um, maybe Greg, the young might be able to um, answer those questions. Cause I know a lot of those determinations are made between uh, the uh, signatory agencies and the proponent. But generally for uh, credits, it's usually a, a one to one ratio. That's how those are usually determined, but there may be some uh, differences in certain banks and on the type of bank that has been created and what sort of restoration or creation has been on the bank. Yeah, yeah sorry, Cody was the, sorry, just was, I, I missed it. Was the, was the uh, ratio question on the, on the crediting side or the impact side? Either. Well, species, the species requirements, conservation requirements are, are so greatly varying that, that there are a whole bunch of different crediting methods. And so typically when we, when we think about just straight uh, mitigation ratios, my experience is that typically is going to happen on the impact side and there'll be a determination about what, what, what's the, the nature and quality of habitat being impacted and based on that, how many, how many credits would need to be purchased? Uh, so I don't know, Cody, if that gets at your question or not, but, uh, but the agencies have developed some methods, for instance, the Sacramento Core District has what we often call the mitigation calculator, and they run through a whole bunch of different factors when they're determining how much uh, offset needs to happen, how much mitigation needs to happen. So that could be like proximity, of, of the bank to the mitigation, I mean, to the impact side, it can be the timeliness of the mitigation. Um, it could be the relative condition of the impact site versus the mitigation site. So that's the nice thing about that is there's a system of analysis and, and then the, the, uh, that's all made public. That's all available to the public when they make those kinds of determinations. Great, and so Laura, Laurel just uh, shared her 
the um, website, I'm sorry, her email again for further questions if questions come up later uh, at mitbank at wildlife.ca.gov. And um, this has been a very thorough summary of, uh, of a state program and really helps frame for, for others working in the field um, and perhaps even new state programs that might come about. I just wanted to see if uh, Betty and, and Laurel, if you want to have some final comments. Wanted to thank you for giving us the opportunity to present today and just kind of tell the California side of the story. And I hope um, everybody that has been able to attend today uh, got some, you know, some good information and some takeaway uh, lessons. And um, hopefully that um, they can implement the program similar to what we're doing in California. Uh, it's funny because, um, you know, we do what we do in California and we've never thought much about, you know, how it's working out in other states until we hear from other people. We get a lot of um, emails from not only other people of, that work at agencies in other states, we also get a lot of contact um, from Japan, China, uh, England, New Zealand, Australia, and they wanna know what is it that we're doing and how does it work and how, how is it that it's so successful? So um, I'm really happy to have been part of this presentation and hopefully um, people get some good takeaways from it. So thank you again for the invitation. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to echo Betty. Thanks so much for setting this up. And, you know, we have an established banking program, but we're still learning and trying to make it better with our updates, with our templates. And so um, we're happy to also hear feedback if um, people want to have suggestions for us or how we can make our program better as well. And learn, we can all learn from each other across the country. So thanks so much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you for that excellent presentation and um, and meeting the schedule and uh, it was a big help. And um, we'll keep the conversation going. And next month, we're gonna talk more about the California diving in deep with a case study with the California tiger salamander. And so hopefully we'll see you back here in a month. Thank you so much. Thank you.